from Shepherd's Grove in Garden Grove, California. Welcome to the Hour of Power with Bobby Schuler. Discover the face and voice of positive Christianity to the world. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. You have picked a good day to come to church. We are so glad that you're here. We believe that the Holy Spirit is present in this place. And we believe that if you came this morning, even if you lost a bet and had to come to church because your sports team lost, or if your girlfriend dragged you here, or you just came in, looking for a glass of water and the greeters wouldn't let you go. We believe that God wanted you here. It is your destiny to be here this morning. And for all of you watching on television, we are so glad that you're participating with us this morning. We know you are a part of this church and we are honored that you are joining us today. Let's give our Hour of Power viewers a welcome and thank them for joining us today. Turn around to those that are standing near you. Greet them warmly in the name of the Lord and say, God loves you and so do I. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for uh, inviting us to your home to be with each other. And we pray, Lord, that you would form us and shape us into the image and likeness of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. All God's people said, amen. amen. be seated. In preparation for this morning's message, hear these words from the book of Joshua. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, 
for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the ark of the covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests, carrying the ark of the covenant, went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, that is, the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. This is the word of the Lord.
Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus on this first day of the week, and we are thankful for the many great things that you are doing in our lives and in our community. And as we look to the week that we just finished, some of us have weeks full of great joys and victories, Lord, and we pray for more of that. Lord, we pray for Bobby as he brings your message to us this morning. Lord, we pray for us. Give us the hearts and the minds to hear what you will have for us this morning. Finally, we pray in the way that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My guest today is Karen Koval. She's a wife, mother, author, Hollywood producer, and the founder of a nonprofit organization, Hollywood Prayer Network. Karen has extensive experience producing TV specials documentaries, and children's programming. She's a member of the Producers Guild of America and a board member of the Biola University Media Task Force. Karen is married to her husband, Jim. They have two sons, Christopher and Cameron. Please welcome with me, Karen Koval. Hey, Karen. Hi, thanks so much. So why don't you just begin by telling us a little bit about what you do for the Hollywood, is it Hollywood Prayer Network? The Hollywood Prayer Network, yes. I became a Christian. I came from Chicago to go to school at USC and became a Christian in college and met my husband, who's a composer, and we started working in the entertainment industry and immediately realized how hard it is. Yeah, he wrote music for movies and things like that. Yes. Um, one of the first things he did years ago was McGee and Me. He wrote all the songs. And I music. loved McGee and Me. Oh, you did. That was like my, that was my jam. Oh, my God. McGee and Me, I was like, I was like eight when that came out. Yes. <laughs> so was he. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we realized we needed prayer. So yeah. we found a small group of people and started praying. And then years later, I thought, you know, it's good that we pray for ourselves, but what we don't have is prayer from the church to pray for Christians who are in the media, arts yeah. and entertainment. And so I thought, okay, there's a kind of a hate relationship between the entertainment industry and the church. Yeah. And if you pray for somebody, you can't hate them. Yeah. So I thought, okay, I'll get the church to pray for Hollywood, and that will build that bridge. Yeah. And it's been an amazing journey. We know of over 10,000 committed Christians in Hollywood now, and yeah. those are only the ones we know. Yeah. So it's a very different environment. It's very exciting. What about sort of the moral piece? You know, like very often we as Christians, we kind of feel like part of our responsibility is to uphold some of the, you know, moral standards for society. I know even sometimes people haven't asked us to do that. That was probably your first answer. <laughs> right. but, uh, but what about that? I mean, what about the moral piece, you know? I think that's why we need more prayer. It's a tough place for a Christian to be in Hollywood where it's very competitive, very yeah. difficult, a lot of temptations. You're judged more by how you look than who you are. And so it's a tough place to be. And we want to be strong morally. And I'm seeing more and more of that as more people pray. Yeah. And we have this undergirding of prayer and we have a community growing where people are not alone and there's a great strength in that and we're seeing not only more moral programming yeah. but we're seeing more moral people standing firm there it's very good now protesting boycotting that's not really your thing right oh no i say i have never met a person who's become a christian because of a boycott yeah that's right good. it doesn't happen yeah. what we find is building relationships letting people trust us finding that our lifestyle is different and wanting to know what that is that's how people change. Yeah. And sometimes Christians think we need to change the content of films and TV shows and music, yeah. but that won't change until we change the hearts of the people who are creating that content. Yeah. And so that's only through prayer. The Holy Spirit's the only one that changes anybody. Yeah. We can just come along, send Christians into Hollywood as media missionaries, yeah. pray for the people who are there, and then watch God do a miraculous work in people's lives. Yeah, that's great. And what do you say to people who are storytellers who want to go into media but just are in love with Jesus and they want to go to Hollywood but they're torn? I mean, what do you say to someone like that? I say go for it. Yeah. Seek Jesus first. 
get involved in a community of Christians, get yourself attached to a church, yeah. and don't settle for mediocrity. Don't settle for anything less. God yeah. supplies our needs. We don't have to be afraid and just take any job. We have to know we have a purpose here, and God's going to use us in that. You know, when I think about as a minister, I love giving my, you know, sermons, you know, and I plan them, and they're all, you know, academic and well thought out. <laughs> and, but then I think about, like, it's hard for me. I've got a church most of my life. It's hard for me to name 10 sermons I've heard. I know preachers, but to actually name the sermon is kind of hard. But you know what's not hard for me is to name 10 stories or 10 movies that changed my life. That's it. Yeah. Uh, we say that uh, Washington, D.C. is the seat of power, but Hollywood is the seat of influence yeah. because stories go straight to the heart. Yeah. And if you can tell a powerful story that really alters somebody's life, they'll remember it forever. And it's really a way that we can show God's love yeah. and God's purpose through just great stories. Yeah. How can we know more about what you're doing and get behind and help you? Oh, I'd love it. We need prayer. Yeah. We pray for Christians and yeah. we pray for non-believers. Yeah. And it's the Hollywood Prayer Network, hollywoodprayernetwork.org. We line up prayer partnerships. We can have intercessors praying for individuals that are working in Hollywood. We have a monthly email saying how to pray for Hollywood this month. And it's great because it shows from the inside out what God is doing in a place that impacts every culture, every people group around the world. Yeah. So come to hollywoodprayernetwork.org and we'll keep you busy. Awesome, great. You know, there's, there's so many people around the world, a sea of people listening. And if you had just one thing to say to them, what would you say? I would say that don't judge the people in the entertainment industry, but to love them and to pray for them. The people who don't know Jesus need him. And the people who do need Jesus need the support that we can give them through prayer. And if we know young people who are great Christians and good artists, send them there, don't discourage them, support them, pray for them, and look at Hollywood as the world's most influential mission field. Wonderful. Why don't we just do that now? Why don't we pray for those who are in Hollywood, who are in the entertainment ministry, and maybe you could just lead us in a prayer for them even now. Can we do that? I love it. Thank okay, you. Okay, sure. Lord, I thank you for being at Shepherd's Grove. I thank you for this church of incredible people. And I ask that you will melt hearts here, that you will give people a passion to pray for the people they're watching in films, TV shows, listening to in music, looking at in artwork. And Lord, would you change Hollywood from the inside out because of the prayers of the saints? Thank you for what you're doing in our media. Thank you for what you're doing in our world because you love us so much. You want us to care for each other, be Christ-like in our lives, and pray for those who don't know you. And I know that today this church can change the world. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Karen. Hello, I'm Ed Arnold. My 60 plus year career in broadcasting has enabled me to come in contact with folks of tremendous influence and great visibility all across the country. I can truly say that regardless of where I go, everyone expresses to me their profound respect and admiration for Dr. Robert H. Schuler and the great ministry that he and Arvella established with God's help. Today, Pastor Bobby Schuler is continuing his grandfather's mission to bring the love of Jesus to a hurting world. Both Pastor Bobby and Dr. Schuler teach through their messages that the timeless words of Jesus are just as important, just as relevant, just as practical today as they were in the beginning. Dr. Schuler began his ministry over 50 years ago, and many people have not heard some of his early sermons. So today, we are happy to offer you this DVD two CD set entitled Dr. Robert Schuler's Sermon on the Mount Collection, featuring four classic messages from the Hour of Power founder, Dr. Robert H. Schuler. Take a look at these timeless messages. From 1974, the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, given by Jesus himself more than 2,000 years ago. Dr. Schuler said the Sermon on the Mount was the only message that deserves the title of the greatest sermon ever preached. Truly I say to you, as long as this earth spins in space, so truly God's word will stand strong. From 1974, I am the American flag. Be proud, be humble, be renewed. As I prepare to celebrate my 200th birthday, I have a prayer. 
Our Father is God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. Tough times never last, but tough people do from 1982. If I had the money, I would buy billboards along all of the roads in the United States, all 50 states. If I had the money, I would buy billboards in the unemployed cities of America. And I'd plaster only one sentence. Tough times never last, but tough people too. And from 1996, a message that reached out to all ages, a possibility thinking lesson for a new generation. It is a little six-line poem that sums up what possibility thinking is all about. Possibilities must be weighed. Then priorities must be swayed. And plans must be laid. And commitments must be made then the price must be paid and the course will be stayed. That's possibility thinking. Strengthen your positive faith in God in a powerful and positive way today. Your DVD CD set will include one DVD containing all four messages and a two disc CD set, each containing two messages. Call today and pledge to give $30 a month for the five summer months or give a one-time gift of $150 and help support the Hour of Power. Call, write, or go online and become a 2015 summer partner. The address is Hour of Power, Box 100, Garden Grove, California, or call toll-free 1-866-GET-HOPE. That's 1-866-438-4673. You can also go online at ourofpower.org. In Canada, the address is Hour of Power, Post Office Box 9050, Surrey, British Columbia, or call toll-free 1-866-581-7654. You can also go online at ourofpower.ca. Thank you for watching the Hour of Power and for your ongoing generous support to help keep this program on the air. Now, let's return to the service. Ladies and gentlemen, it's such a privilege to welcome back to Shepherd's Grove, Naomi Streamer, all the way from Nashville, from Canada originally. Yes, thank you so much. It's so good to be here this morning. Hi, Naomi. Now, Naomi is really seriously one of my favorite musicians. I have her album in my car. I listen to it all the time. You knew then everything that I knew now is a song that I listen to, like when I, especially in a time of victory. And uh, how are you doing? I am doing really good. I'm, I'm just loving God, loving what he's doing in ministry and through work that I have the blessing to be a part of. And, you know, just my husband and I have been touring around and watching lives changing in one particular life that I just love. And he emails me every once in a while. There's a young gentleman who saw the show Paralyzed. Power power. Yes, yeah, yeah. this show right here, yeah. and was paralyzed in a hospital, thought he had nothing to live for, and watched the program, and through this program, one show realized God had a plan for his life. Mm -hmm. And he has emailed me every once in a while, kept in touch, I got to meet him, and watching the light now come from this young man who thought that his life was over, yeah. wanted to end it all. And so it's amazing what God is doing. Oh, around the world. That's awesome. And if you're at home watching today, we pray that this music touches your heart and helps you to take the next step in your life towards God's calling for you. Naomi, we're so glad you're here. God bless you. Thanks for being. We're, we're, we're so glad you're here. You. Ladies and gentlemen, Naomi Streamer. Just enough, you are more 
I just want to take a minute, uh, last night we had dinner at my house, invited some special guests, some from the church here and some from out of town, and uh, we just wanted to welcome them here. Thank you guys, we're so glad you're here in the first and second row. Let's give them a hand and welcome them for being here. Well, we're so glad you guys are here. For all of you watching on television, if you're ever in this area, we're very, very close to Angels Stadium, go Angels. Uh, <laughs> The Honda Center, go Dex. And uh, very close to, of course, the ultimate Disneyland. And uh, if you're ever near any of those places on a Sunday, come visit us. We want to meet you. Um, I'm usually here after the second service, meeting and greeting people, and I'd love to meet you. So come visit us at 9.30 and 11.15. Also, uh, if you haven't been here before, and most churches, they say, put that cell phone away. We say, whip that cell phone out. Take pictures and live tweet the service. So those of you who are in the church, if you want to tweet the service, go for it. Hashtag Hour of Power. My Twitter handle is at Bobby Schuler. Are you ready? <laughs> All right. I know you've been standing and sitting a lot, but it's time to stand one more time. We're going to say this confession together. Someday, if you believe it, it will change your life Hold your hands out with me like this. Say it with me. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus 
and share his love with the world. Amen. You can be seated. We had the very emotional experience of burying my grandfather, Robert Schuler. Many of you know him. Some of you are not familiar. But uh, he is known as a legend in the faith. He was a big influencer on many of the modern churches that we have today. Many big, big pastors, Rick Warren, um, Bill Hybels, and others were deeply influenced uh, by my grandfather. And he introduced some amazing things into the way that the church thinks about mission in particular, that the church isn't supposed to be just a place that you invite people to come to, but rather, like Jesus, we ought to actually go to people right where they are. And so he was an innovator and someone who thought of creative ways to do that. And probably one of the, one of the greatest things about my grandpa was his message, and it was a message of possibility thinking. Very dramatic, <laughs> very theatrical, but that was my grandpa. You know, he was not performing. In private, he acted like that all the time. If you're his friends, you know that uh, I think one of my cousins said, when I would walk out, I'd say, Grandpa, have a good day. And he'd go, no, make it a great day. You know, that was him, you know. And uh, one of the interesting things is today I am speaking on faith. And what's interesting about that is I plan my sermons a year in advance. I do them way, way, way in advance. And today's sermon was, was planned a long time ago. And yet, as I'm listening to different people's stories about my grandfather, I'm remembering what he said to me, which was, Bobby, you know, people criticize me, but all I'm doing is talking about faith. That what I'm doing is teaching people about faith in terms and a vocabulary that modern people understand. And so it was interesting is as I'm sort of sitting there in the funeral, my grandfather, who had dementia for the last you know, number of years, was sort of my, my old grandpa, the one that I remember who mentored me, who sat with me, who fished with me, who believed in me, was sort of coming back to life in, in a new way that I hadn't experienced in a, new, in, a, in a while. So today we're going to talk about faith, and I'm no doubt going to be quoting my grandpa from time to time, and, I, and you're going to just have to know it's him. I'm not going to keep saying my grandpa says, but uh, anyway, let's begin. So today, if you are watching on TV, or if you're here in the church, and you say, I'm stuck, I'm immobilized, I'm broken, um, I'm, I'm bored, maybe you have a huge decision in your life that is before you, and you have to go either right or left, and you don't know what to do. Maybe you feel yourself emotionally or spiritually crippled. Today, I want to encourage you to be a person that trusts God and a person that has faith and a person that takes risks. And so here's the first Dr. Schuler quote of the morning. He always said, trust is spelled R-I-S-K. Trust is spelled R-I-S-K. Risk is the way that we prove that we trust in God. So today, let's talk about faith. This is the scripture that was read today from Chad, masterfully done Chad, was uh, the passage about the crossing of the Jordan. And um, the crossing of the Jordan is important because in the story, it's not the first time the Hebrew people crossed the water, it's the second time. And I want to sort of compare the crossing of the Jordan to the crossing of the Red Sea. Uh, long ago, the Jewish people in Scripture, it says the Jewish or Hebrew people were enslaved by Pharaoh. And, uh, and God calls a man named Moses to lead these people out of Egypt into a new home, a place called the Promised Land. And after a series of events, Pharaoh releases God's people, and as they're traveling at one point, Pharaoh changes his mind and decides he's going to send his army to capture these people and bring them back to Egypt. And these Hebrew people find themselves pitted between the, the Yam Suf, oftentimes translated as the Red Sea, we don't really know what that is. It could be the Sea of Reeds, which might be actually a smaller body of water north 
Anyway, it's my Bible nerd coming out. But it's some sea, some body of water, likely the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds. And they're stuck. And here's this army coming at them. And they don't know what to do because if they go back that way, they'll be captured by the Egyptians. But on the other side is this large body of water. So God tells Moses to raise his hand to the water. And this is how God's going to part the sea. It says that Moses held up his staff and held up, held up his hand like this all night long. And a strong eastern wind came. And as the night went on, the sea parted. And God made way for his people to cross this body of water. An amazing miracle. Fantastic. One of the most famous biblical miracles that people talk about. And the Hebrew people cross and they sort of begin their 40-some year journey to the promised land. And as the Egyptians pursue them to murder and hurt and harm them, God protects the Hebrew people by causing this body of water to then crash and destroy the Egyptian army. And they are led to safety. Now, as the story carries on, they go through the wilderness, they have these incredible experiences, and they finally get to what will soon be Israel, and they see the promised land. In between them and the promised land is this river, the Jordan. And it's during harvest time, which means that it's not just a gentle bubbling stream. It is a rough river rapids, flowing, overflowing, rushing. Moses has since died. And God says, I want you to cross this river into the Jordan. But there's all these people and they don't know how they're going to do it. And God says, take the Ark of the Covenant before you. And this time I want you to step in the water as it's rushing and flowing and dangerous. Now, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, if you've seen Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know exactly what it looks like. (laughs) It is a... Big golden box, and if you open it, scary ghosts come out and turn Nazis into dust. We all know the story, right? Um, That's actually what the Ark of the Covenant kind of looked like. And in the Ark of the Covenant were the tablets of the Ten Commandments and some other cool Jewish memorabilia. And uh, anyway, you have this box, and the box is filled and sort of enshrouded in Shekinah glory and God's power. And it is so filled with this incredible energy that if you were to actually touch it, the power of this thing would kill you. And so the Levites, who are the priests, use wooden poles to sort of carry this box so that they don't actually have to touch it. And God tells the, and and, and represents the real, actual, almost physical presence of God with his people. And what does God say? I want you to step in a roaring, rushing river carrying your golden death box. (laughs) I want you to carry this thing and I want you to step in the water. And as they do, what happens as we read in the story? As they step in the water, the sea parts. Now the thing I want you to pull from these two stories, the parting of the Red Sea in the parting of the Jordan is this. Many of you, when you were young in your faith, when you were new in your walk with God, it felt like God would just simply part the sea for you. That's because you were immature in your faith. But as you grew in your faith in Jesus Christ, and as you grow in your maturity in faith, he will stop parting the water for you and ask you to take the first step. Part of maturing in faith isn't that God doesn't part the sea anymore, but that he often wants you to take even greater risk, to take even a bolder step than you did before, to confidently say that even though danger faces you, if you step into this water, you trust that God will keep you safe. You know, because before he parted the Red Sea, if he parted the Red Sea, He can part the Jordan. Maturing in faith means that God will continually ask you to take even bigger risks than you did before. That is the moral of the story. 
You see, my friends, taking risks in faith is the thing that brings our faith to life. If you've become a person who has stopped taking risks for Jesus, it is likely that your faith, that your religion, that your walk with God is beginning to shrivel and wither. That is because faith is made alive in you when you trust in Jesus and take a risk. Now, God, as you take risks, God will be faithful in those things. And as you see him victorious in your life, he will continue to ask you to, to take even bigger risks in your life. But if you stop taking risks for the Lord, if you always do what's safe and comfortable, you will find that your faith will begin to wither and even die. And I don't want that for you. I want you to come alive in Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen? Christianity is all about doing with Jesus what we cannot do on our own. You say, I cannot do this. I think God's calling me to do this. But Bobby, I can't do this. Of course you can't do this. I'm not asking you to do it. I'm asking you to do it with the Lord. You see, you're a minority all by itself, but you plus God equals a majority. Can I get an amen? amen. That's another Dr. Schuler. That one's free. <laughs> now, many people ask, you know, you see throughout Scripture this idea that God is constantly asking his followers to act in faith. And one of the big questions many people ask me is, why does God ask me to have faith? You know, why, don't, why can't I just pray for something and it just happens whether or not anything is, you know, whether or not I do something? In other words, why can't God just do all the work? <laughs> and one of the reasons that God asks us to have faith, and particularly faith in action, is the same reason that parents ask them to help them with projects around the house. I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old, and they love participating and helping me do things. And it always makes it slower and always makes it worse. I tried building a Lego castle, and that just was a nightmare. And you know... Many times, parents will ask their children to participate in tasks around the house. Why do they do that? Why does a dad ask his daughter to help him work on his car? Why does a mother ask her son to help her tune the piano or, you know, barbecue some fish or some things? Why? Two reasons. One, it helps the child become an adult. They learn actual skills, right? It's a part of maturing. Number two, and even more importantly, it's how parents and children bond. One of the main ways people bond, we always thought it was, you know, that, that people bond over how they look or what kind of language they use or even race or things like that. In truth, people bond when they do stuff together. And let me tell you something. I bond with my children when I do stuff with them. We bond with God when we take faith and become co-doers, co-laborers, co-creators with him. Yeah, he can do it better on his own than we can, but then we shrivel up and die and we never mature in faith and we never grow in our walk with him. That's the kind of God we serve. He's your dad. And yeah, dad can do it faster and quicker on his own, but dads like to have their kids participate because that's how kids learn and that's how kids bond with their parents. Can I get an amen? amen. So... Faith is an important part of growing in your relationship with God, especially because God's invisible. And faith is an important part of maturing as a believer. And this is what I want you to remember about faith. Faith doesn't matter if it doesn't do anything. Faith doesn't matter if there's no action associated with it. The book of Hebrews says, Faith is a substance. It's like something you got. And Ephesians says, faith is a gift to everyone. In other words, everybody has faith. You've got faith. You've got faith. Everybody has faith. But not everyone who has faith has a faith that matters. The only faith that matters is not faith that is had, but faith that is released. In other words, faith only matters when it is released in action, when it is a faith that takes risks. 
Faith only matters when faith does. Faith does. Um, And so I want to encourage you. Faith ought to be then stirred up and released. Stirred up and released. Um, James says that faith without action is dead. Sometimes we say faith without works, but I think that oftentimes we think of that as faith without, you know, like good works, like doing good things. It certainly is that, but it's not limited to that. Faith without being Peter who steps out of the boat is dead. Faith without throwing your nets on the other side of the water is dead. Faith without saying, rise up and walk is dead. Faith without action is dead. James says, you say to me that something like, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus. Maybe I could say, you say to me, I believe in the Trinity and I believe that God's immutable and passable and fallible, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe in the inerrant scriptures and I believe in all of this. And I say to you, good, even the devils believe in that and tremble. But what does that matter? If you believe in all of these things, but it doesn't change your behavior, it doesn't matter. Faith without action is dead. And I might reverse that and say, faith with action is alive. You want to feel alive in your faith? You want to flourish? You want to bloom where you're planted? You want to live a life that is so overflowing with power and joy and intimacy with God? Become a man or woman of faith and be a person who lives with faith in action. Become a person who takes risk. All of us have faith. All of us have faith. But some of us, our faith has sort of, you know, it's kind of settled a little bit. It's kind of taking a nap. I once was hearing a a, a great woman of God, and she was talking about faith, and she said, you know, faith is like chocolate milk. And I'm thinking, oh, great. This is going to be like chocolate milk. She's like, you know, you, you, you put the powder or the the syrup in, you know, and you put the milk in and you mix it up and it's, you know, brown and cold and delicious. And you set it there on the counter and you're about to drink it and then the phone rings. And maybe you go and you do something and you come back and what happens? It splits. You know, you got all the chocolate at the bottom. You got all the milk at the top. And, you know, you, you think, that's not chocolate milk. It's got to be stirred up, right? And she said, faith is like this. You just got to, you got to stir it up. You got to stir it up, baby. You got to stir it up. Stir it. And when she said that, I I was just like, you know what? That is, yes, that is exactly right. In my experience, that is exactly right. There is something about, you know, all of us have been given faith, but the first step to acting in faith is stirring it up. Very often we think of one of the best ways to stir up faith is worship, absolutely. Some kind of worship or prayer. But the best way to stir up your faith is to remember is to remember. Hannah and I, when we go to Florida uh, with her family, the Presleys, yes, they are related to Elvis, pretty sweet. Uh, When we go to Florida and uh, we will have times of prayer and she comes from a family of dynamic believers, people who have faith. Her parents were these like, you know, Jesus movement hippies that lived in like Jesus communes. And they have this thing where before they're praying for something audacious, like a miracle or some kind of a breakthrough, in finances or sickness or, or some kind of addiction or bondage, they, before they pray, they begin taking turns sharing stories. They begin to say, remember that time when Dr. Presley's leg was short and it got extended? And remember that time when you were deaf and we prayed and you were healed? And I remember the time when this person had this breakthrough in addiction. And, and I remember a time when this person had this. And, and what we're doing is we're telling stories. We're about to step into the Jordan, but before we do, we have to remember that God parted the Red Sea. You remember, we serve a God who parted the Red Sea. And the God who parts the Red Sea can part the Jordan if I step inside. Can I get an amen? And so there's something about before releasing your faith, stirring up your faith and remembering the great things that God has done. Scripture is all about remembering, especially the Old Testament. As you read through, it's all about remembering the great things that God has done. And so before you act in faith, maybe you don't have memories like that. 
Steal somebody else's memories. You know, someone that you know is a person of faith. Ask them to tell you their stories. You say, God, Sally remembers when you worked in her life. And I want to see that in my life, you know. So stir it up. So first, stir up your faith. Then release your faith. If you've not released your faith, your faith doesn't matter. Faith only matters in action. And so I'm going to ask you, if you feel stuck, if you feel immobilized, if you feel broken, if you feel withered, step into Jordan. Step into Jordan. Watch God part the sea and feel your heart come to life. Take a risk for God. You know, some of you, you will take a risk and you will fail. But I want to just tell you something. Even if you take a risk and fail, you're one step closer to understanding God's heart. Most people that even take a risk and fail say, Ah, I took a risk, I failed. But you know what? I broke through my fear. And something came to life in me. And next time I need to take a risk, it's going to be that much easier. See, see, taking risks shatters fear. It breaks that when your feet feel like they're stuck in cement, taking a risk breaks that. And so some of you watching on TV, some of you here in the house this morning, you have a dream. Maybe your dream is to build a business or to start a new ministry. Um, Take a risk. Do it. Some of you come here today and you think, I need a new me. Maybe you're addicted and, and you need to go to rehab, but... Nobody knows about your secret life. I I guarantee that some people do. Take a risk. Maybe you have some deep, dark sin that you're hiding from the world, from your spouse or from your kids, your parents or colleagues, and you just feel like I can't move on in life unless somehow take a risk. Maybe you think, I want to have an intimate prayer life, but I'm just so busy. I I want to encourage you to sacrifice your time, your money, your job, to take a risk and put your prayer life first. Perhaps some of you, you find yourself wanting to be a part of something bigger than you. Maybe you feel like you're supposed to give an audacious gift to a neighbor or friend or a charity. Maybe you're supposed to give your car to somebody. Maybe you're supposed to go out and buy someone a great suit for a job interview and you don't know if you can afford it but you know it would really help them take a risk take a risk some of you are in broken relationships and you haven't talked to that person you loved in years you think they hate your guts and they probably do and you want to reunite with them take a risk get on the phone today and call them they may turn you back but you're going to find that you came even more to life because you tried and don't give up Don't give up. They may call you back. It might take another year, but they may call you back. (laughs) You see, in life, God will call you to do things. And if you continue to turn a deaf ear to the voice of God, your heart will become cold to God and you will not be able to hear his voice any longer. And if you pray and you say, God, I can't hear your voice anymore. I want to hear what you have to say to me. God will speak, but only in a whisper. And when you hear that whisper, take a risk, act in faith, step into the Jordan and watch your faith come to life. Take a risk. All right. Just this last note, maybe, maybe you're here today and you're sick. Maybe you're watching on TV and you just found out you've got one year left to live. I want to say to you, no matter where you are, no matter how old or sick or wounded you are, you're alive for a reason. Sometimes when we are only given a, a year or a month left to live, that is like the, the basketball you know, point guard is, Two seconds left on the clock and you're down by one. What are you going to do with that basketball? Are you going to just give up and walk away? You're alive for a reason. There's something about having just enough time left to take a risk. And I promise you, if the doctor gave you a year, if you become a a person of faith, I'll give you more. I believe it. There's something about people who don't give up and don't quit that God brings them new life. 
and new power. So no matter who you are, God can use you. And he wants to use you. God is calling you to step in the Jordan and be a person of faith. Would you bow your heads with me? One of the greatest steps any person can take is to become a follower of Jesus. See, all these things that we do in this world, they matter, but the thing that matters most is that we're at home in the Lord. All of us will die, but if you live in Jesus, you will live, and you'll live forever. And so if that's you today, I want you to pray this prayer with me, and I'm just going to ask the whole church prays with me, and you're watching on television right where you're sitting. Pray this prayer with me. Father in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. Bring me to life. Mark me for heaven. Make me your son or your daughter. Lord, save me. I need you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you, you are called to heaven. God has a calling for you. And, uh, and if that's you, find an elder we want, or a pastor. We want to meet you and, uh, and come alongside you. If you're watching at home, call us or write to us. We want to support you and help you on your new journey. Amen. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.